All right, man. What's your name and where are you from? My name is 1090 Jake. I'm from Massachusetts. I was born around the Boston area. I was raised down in Florida. From the Boston area. Yeah, so like anytime you meet anybody and you're from up here, everyone just tells you Boston, but 90% of the people aren't actually from Boston. So I was born like 15 minutes away in Malden, which is another city. But if you tell somebody, you're just going to be like, I'm from Boston. Because no one knows anything in Massachusetts except Boston. Okay, okay. So you're not in Florida no more? Nah, I moved out of Florida uh, the day after I got out of prison. Okay, uh, well, let's start off with, um, well, first, let me unlock this thing. So, all right. All right, so first things first, uh, what made you, how, how did you end up going to prison in Florida? Um, when I moved down there, I was already, you know, getting into a lot of trouble. I moved down there with my grandmother, so she couldn't really control too much I was doing. And, um, the reason I went to prison, we left a party. I was with a couple of friends or whatever, and we're walking home and, um, canine pulls up, canine pulls up. He jumps out of the car. He grabs the uh, the door to the canine. He says, any of you move, I'm letting the dog out. And he's calling for backup. So I'm looking around for a fence or anything that I know I can get away, but there's nothing here. So we're kind of like, we got to just take it. The police come. Everybody's there. We're starting to get searched. I get searched. Pat me down completely. Doesn't say anything. I'm cuffed up, though. So they tell us that uh, we tried to break into a car and the homeowner called the police. We never did though. We never did. The charges were dropped within like a couple of weeks on a burglary of a conveyance. We had nothing to do with it. It was more or less like an excuse. Um, so they get us, they search my buddy. He had weed on him. So he's going to juvie because he was 17 at the time. I had just turned 18. So I forget who it was. Somebody with a little bit of higher rank than the officer that searched me. He searched me again before he put me in the car he found a loaded gun. So he gets the gun. He starts yelling at the officer, like, how did you not see this? You know, this could have turned out worse. Not that I was going to do anything to one of them or nothing like that. But boom, they got the gun. So I go to county jail uh, October uh, 2012. I had just turned 18 in August. And um, it was for a can of concealed firearm and a burglary of a conveyance. And you had, so the, like I said, you had the gun up? on you? Yeah, I had a gun on me. And the cop? Didn't even notice it? Bro, he patted me down. I had it in, in the front of me. And not only that, while I'm handcuffed, they had the witness pull up and they're flashing the lights at me so I can't see who's in the car. And they had the witness point me up. Oh, I don't know how they don't see this thing because it had a laser on it and everything. Like, it's both. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it was souped up. So I'm standing there. I'm panicking, thinking it's going to fall because, you know, this is 2012. I was still saggy shorts, you know, saggy shirt, all that. Everything's super big. And um, they didn't notice it, but they were going to charge me with the burglary. The other guy searched me real quick and he found it in two seconds. Yeah, that's crazy, so, man. Yeah, I thought I was going to be good because if I get in the car, I'm going to try to do something. But yeah, it got me with it and it was over with from that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, then... Uh, once I went to county, uh, and were you a felon? Probably, were you a felon yet before uh, this? No. Okay. Well, that's so good. So I that's had good. like juvenile charges. I had juvenile felonies, but I beat all the cases. None of them actually stood. Um, at the time I was arrested, I was on juvenile probation. So I got a felony battery on a detainee from inside of the um, the Jack Center, the Juvenile Assessment Center, which is where you go before you go to juvie. I knocked the kid out in there and he was like unresponsive. So he had to go to the hospital and all that. So I got rebooked for that. I was on probation, juvenile probation for that, which ended up getting bumped down to a misdemeanor battery. So it wasn't felony probation or nothing like that, but I had just got put on probation for this right before this happened. But once you get an adult charge, Everything from juvenile is irrelevant at that point. Yeah. So, I mean, I wasn't really worried about that. But, nah, this was my first first felony. You know what I mean? And then about a week inside of county jail, when it ended up happening was I got a call out. So, in Hillsborough County Jail in Tampa, you either go – you go to Orient Road first, 
or in your road is where like they process you and whatever. And then you're going to get sent to Falkenberg after a couple of days. Falkenberg, um, what? That's a prison or a jail? No, nah, it's a jail. So Hillsborough County has two jails. They have the orientation, which isn't that big. And then they have Falkenberg, which is like 4,000 inmates in one spot. It's one of like the largest jails, I think, in the country. And um, when you go over there, it's so big that when you get there, they have to put you inside of like little go-karts, like golf carts, and drive you to your dorm. So you get to your dorm. They got like 64-man open cell. It's open bay. There's no cells. Uh, but Orion Road has the cells. So open bay meaning like a, like a dorm. Yeah, it's just a big open space. You got like little cubicles, so there'll be a concrete wall that comes up. It's like waist high, and that's what separates a cubicle. So you got four beds in each cubicle, and uh -huh. if you're in a corner, you'll have a bunk bed. Okay. But it's open bay, so you're sleeping next to everyone. There's no cell. Um, you never leave this dorm. I wreck is inside of the dorm. So there's a glass wall. You open the door to that when the CEO comes in in the morning, he unlocks the door and you go outside and you're in a concrete room with a, a fenced in roof. So that's the only way you see sunlight is out of the fence. You can't actually see anything except for the sky and concrete. Well, that ain't so, bad. At least you got to see, even the jails I was in, man, he, the windows were completely blurred out. I mean, little skinny windows, you couldn't see out of them. Oh, yeah, that's and one tough. of the jails and, you know, sunlight. Only time we got sunlight was walking, you know, uh, going to prison. <laughs> well, I mean, by the time you wake up, everybody, it's usually all the old guys. They're already outside yeah. on the side of the wall that got all the sun anyway. So, yeah, but I mean, yeah, it was good in a sense. You had the birds come down and be chirping in the morning and all that. Oh, you yeah, know what I mean? Right. But And the guard, like there's there's a, uh, a table inside of the dorm with you. So there's a guard present at all times inside of the dorm. Wow. Yeah, I mean, they got videos on YouTube of guys getting choked out in Hillsborough County and all that because they just sit one of them in there, but the wreck is behind him. So if he's not looking, you catch a corner, you can do whatever you want, you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, there's never a reason for you to get called out unless you're going to medical or your lawyer came and wants to talk to you and they can actually bring lawyers in to the dorm, there's a little private like room area that they lock you in and you can talk to your lawyer in the dorm. So um, like a weekend, I get a call, or not a call, but I get like a call out. I run up to the office, he says, hey, you're going out, da da da. I don't know what it's for. So they take me down to um, where they normally do like the stuff with the lawyers. So you got a whole bunch of chairs, a whole bunch of inmates sitting down. This is the only time you see the female inmates too because their lawyers come in the same thing. And um, they walk me up, they let me in. I see these two guys. They look like something off First 48, looking super serious. One of them was from Texas, so he had the strong country accent. Yeah. And they start talking to me, and they're asking about my case. So I'm thinking, you know, my aunt got me a lawyer or something like that. That wasn't the case. These were investigators. Mm -hmm. So they basically were asking about the case. And um, they cut it short. They were like, look, if you want to help me, I can help you. I told them to F off and I got taken out. You know what I mean? And it was actually written in my discovery paperwork. Inmate da -da -da, told us to F off and he was escorted back to his cell. Hmm. The very next day after telling them that, I got hit with 16 more charges uh -huh. out of nowhere. So I checked my little POS, like the kiosk inside of the um in the dorm or whatever, where you can check your canteen and everything like that. I had a list of charges. So what they did is um, on top of the burglary of a conveyance and the carrying concealed firearm, they took that firearm and linked me to an armed burglary. So I got hit with an armed burglary, 15 counts of grand theft of a firearm and grand theft 5,000 to 10,000. And then they added on a misdemeanor battery from a complete other case where I hit someone at like a bus stop or something like that. So in total, I had 21 charges, Jeez. like 20 of them being felonies, one misdemeanor. So, I mean, <laughs> okay, so if the gun came back, is uh, see, that, I don't understand, like, uh, don't they have to know what kind of how they trace that gun from those crimes to that gun? Like how they know it was uh, that the gun. Serial number. I know they but, took the serial number. But how did they know from that other the past crimes what the serial number was? You know what I mean? Like 
So the person who the firearms were taken from, I knew. Uh-huh. I knew who it was, you know what I mean? So, I mean, I've been convicted so I can speak on it. I knew the person and I went and basically violated that person and took all their stuff. Uh-huh. Um, so how they linked it is my co-defendant was arrested before me. You know what I mean? In Florida, if they smell weed, they got the right to search whatever they want to do. So something happened at my co-defendant's house where a gun went off and it went through his floor and it hit a little girl's bed in the apartment under his. So thank God the little girl wasn't in the bed. I guess she was in the brother's room. The father was gone at work, whatever, whatever. Police went to my co-defendant's house. They knocked on the door, they smelled the weed, they started to do a search. They found two handguns, they found a shotgun, and then they found like random stolen stuff from a completely other situation, like TVs and whatnot. The shotgun was legal, because if you're over 18 with no felony, you can get a shotgun, a rifle. Um, The two handguns, the serial numbers trace back to that same specific house. Now the guy whose house that was, he had all of his registered, he had all the paperwork. Oh, so all of those charges were because of a robbery from that guy's house. So he knew, yeah. so so that's how the cops got the serial number. Okay, okay, okay. Exactly. So I thought it was just some police. random person or something. I'm like, how does a random person even know what the serial number is? You know what I mean? Nah, so he called the police and um, he told them all the information on the firearms and everything like that. My co-defendant gets caught with two. And then like a week later, I get caught and it's another one from the 15 that went missing. Okay. So at that point, they had us tied in. And, um, you know, I went to court and when they take take you to court in Tampa, they put you underground and you're in this big, big cell full of like 40 people. And I'm in there with, with him, with my co-defendant, the kid whose house got searched or whatever, but he's looking real nervous. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he might talk. I, it wasn't really that because I did a lot with this kid, but I didn't know him well. I was introduced to him by someone else, but the same day I met him, I found out what he was about more or less. So we started, doing stuff together and I felt confident that we can make some moves together. And within the short amount of time we knew each other, we got a lot done, you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, he's telling me that someone else is talking already. He's like, yeah, this person's talking, this person's talking. But from what I know, they have nothing to do with the case, period. Not involved with it, not arrested for it, not charged with it. So it's not making sense to me. We go to court. Um, we basically just plead not guilty. We go back, whatever, whatever. The next time I went to court, I'm by myself now. I don't see him. I look out into the little audience we got and I see that he bonded out. He's got a lawyer, but he's not making eye contact with me. I'm staring at him. I'm not paying attention to nothing else. I'm looking at him and he won't look at me. Yeah, so you're, I'm like, what? you're talking about when, cause he's on the streets. Yeah, so he's in the audience with a little nice suit and tie that he just rented or whatever. Oh, so y'all can literally stare at people like that? What? It's completely open, bro. If if your people got touched by somebody and you go into court, you can jump on an inmate. There's nothing blocking you. You might get shot by a deputy, but we're chained up and we're all sitting down next to each other in a, in a booth over to the left of the judge. And then you got the whole full audience just hanging out watching. You can have That's cell crazy. phones in court, everything. See, yeah. the court the court process over here is uh, you're sitting in a tank right through a door that goes into the courtroom. Okay. And each person, when they call their name, the bailiff goes to the little tank right through the door, grabs the person. They don't even let you look back at the people there. They say, yeah, keep your that, faith. That's how it is in Massachusetts. I yeah. got arrested once out here and they did it like that. And you're in like a glass tank. No yeah. one can touch you. But nah, down in Florida, bro, they take you out like you're in a chain gang. Yeah. Everybody's handcuffed and everything. All you sit next to each other on a big row. Well, that's pretty cool. I guess you get a little show. You can check out the ladies in there. And stuff. Yeah, you know <laughs> what I mean? You get to put on and do your thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's kind of one of the things you can enjoy when you go into court, if you can enjoy it at all. But um, yeah, yeah. When I seen him, I was just like, there's something ain't right. You know what I mean? And this was later on in the case, you know what I'm saying? Like later on in the courts, because I only did about six months in county. And um, I go to another one. He's there. His mother's there. 
He's got a lawyer now, big souped up fat guy, and he just won't look at me. His mother looked at me, then looked away. We made eye contact. I'm like, something ain't right. So I go back and uh, I make a phone call. I remember this kid's number. I don't know how I remember the number, but I remembered it. I called him and I'm like, yo, I think da 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 snitching. And I'm dumb at the time. Like, I'm green. I don't know. I shouldn't have did it. I'm like, man, y'all go handle that. You know what I mean? I'm mad. Oh, I'm going no. off the phone. Like, y'all go handle that. And what ended up happening was that night, I see um like three sheriff officers come in into the to the dorm and they got on they got chains with them. They come right up to me, chain my ankles up, chain my wrists up, chain me around my waist, they take me to the confinement on a conspiracy. So I go to confinement. And uh, I talked to the captain. I'm like, Captain, what happened? So they let me know, like, were you on the phone saying things you shouldn't have been saying? I didn't say nothing because I'm not going to play dumb. You know what I mean? I was just like, damn, I wasn't even really thinking. While I'm in confinement, I get a letter, you know, from court because you get all your paperwork mailed to you. Hold on. Before, before, you, before you go on, for people that might not know, he got hemmed up. Uh, he was about to get fresh charges for saying to go get them you because the phone calls in jail are recorded and they there's key words especially look man people don't think that they listen to this stuff you know they're listening they're like oh man my case ain't serious they're not clocking my phone you better think twice you know you can't even talk to inmates if you tell an inmate something you shouldn't have said they might bring that inmate in on your case as a witness against you just off word of mouth yeah a lot of people think you know felons they're not credible witnesses they want to hear what they have to say though Yeah, still sure. listen, and it ain't sure. gonna work in your favor. Yeah, but um, I get the paper, I open it up. It's got my co-defendant's name, and it says he went from my co-defendant to a state witness. Oh man! So I took that letter and I mailed it out the same day I got it. I mailed that letter out and I sent it, you know, to my people and let everybody know and put them on blast because he's out. Okay, let me ask you this: Uh, were you uh? associating with anyone like were you part of any kind of gang or anything like that yeah okay and that's so you y'all are pretty close knit well the streets and not stuff. i mean i was close with the gang but the my co-defendant wasn't affiliated with anything okay and you were you know you were running running that route on the streets before you even got locked up yeah so i was blood on the street so okay a lot of that also helped with the um the conflict inside of the jail. So I, I watched the other video you did with um dude from Maryland. Yeah. The white yeah. blood. Yeah. And he's he's former or whatever like that. Um so one thing that happened with me is when I went in, a lot of people were questioning me off rip just because I'm white. I'm not mixed with nothing. I don't have Puerto Rican in me, nothing. Those were a lot of the questions being asked because if you got two percent puerto rican in you, you now makes it, it makes it a little it. better yeah you know what i mean just a little bit and you're good i was like nah i'm italian and irish what's up what do we what's up and uh, uh the people i was affiliated with though the people that i rocked with on the street were well known so off of their face a lot of situations de-escalated and then you know some situations still went full force so i mean was there many you, was there many uh, other white bloods in there in county jail no i didn't meet one in county jail that claimed to be full white he might have said he was mixed with something but not any that was full white in prison yeah so but it's very very rare okay yeah and like you said uh you know believe it or not knowing the right people uh coming up under the right people and the knowledge and the way you spit stuff to, to individuals, they kind of know, hey, this cat, this cat's legit. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean everything, everything has to check out in every aspect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially if you're gonna rock with a gang that isn't your race, and people typically don't think you would be a part of. Everything needs to check out, or else there's gonna be issues. You know, everywhere you go. Yeah. But that's another part of it. Is like, I've heard people say things like. Oh, if you go out west, you got to rock with your race. So if you go this way, you got to rock with that. Man, listen, if you're going to be this here, you 
got to be this everywhere. If you go to the feds, you got to be the same thing you were in Florida State. You can't be switching up. And when you pick your friends, you pick your enemies. So that's just how you got to rock. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, a lot, of, a lot of cats on the west, on the west coast, man. They also think not even if not if you're just white. They think a lot of the gangs out here are just you know, because you say food, man. You know, just not they're they're fake. You know. Uh, I've heard that too, but at the same time, I met a lot of people from the west in Florida State Prison, directly mm-hmm. from there, born and raised from San Diego to L.A. You know what I mean? Uh, I met people from the west that were in the feds and they had charges in Florida. I feel like there's always gonna be people that don't like you, period. My roots don't trace back to LA. Everyone gonna be like, oh no, nah, blood started in LA. Blood started in LA. New York started a whole nother breed. You know what I mean? And how I look at it is, you know, what happened in LA was more, it was more or less based on that time, that era, when people were coming together, when community Unities were sticking up for each other versus if you look at the 90s in New York, these were drug gangs. These were money gangs. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a whole nother vibe, a whole nother story. So ain't nobody coming over here telling me nothing. Ain't nobody coming to Florida telling us nothing. You're not going to tell us to stop, you know? Yeah. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. Was there a lot of, uh, did you see any Aryan Brotherhood or white, any kind of white gangs in there? Aryan Brotherhood isn't sanctioned in the state of Florida. I'm pretty sure on that. Okay. Uh, in county, no. It, to be honest, bro, if you're white and you get locked up in the state of Florida, like, there's nothing for you. No one's <laughs> for you. No one's got your back. White boys, like, when you come in, you're not. You're at a disadvantage, like man, and that's all there is yeah. to it. And that's how exactly how it is. In Virginia and a bunch of other East Coast uh, prisons and, and jails. Yeah, it's so. just, it's not, there's no love that way. You know what I mean? And the COs are white, mostly, depending on which part of Florida you're in. And they don't like you either. Yeah. Because if you're not like a redneck country bumpkin, you know what I mean? They're not having none of that. You got to be exactly like them. But as far as white gangs, in Florida State Prison, one of the biggest white gangs is called Unforgiven. And they rock the swastika, you know what I mean? A lot of the symbolisms that a lot of the other white gangs will use as well. I've never They're even not, heard of them before. Lucy, well, yeah, that's that's a specific Florida white gang, Unforgiven. Unforgiven, yeah, that's new to me. But I mean, like, in my personal opinion, like what I personally saw, because every compound is different. We got like 140 compounds in the state of Florida, 140 prisons. So. Everyone's story is going to be different. From what I saw, whites never ran a pound. Whites never had a say in anything on the pound. The only action that they did was amongst themselves. So if they found out one of their brothers told or something, they'll handle that. But other than that, like most of the time when two white boys are arguing, you'll have someone else just tell them to sit down and shut up. And that's what they're going to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're not really a force, but everybody, it doesn't matter what gang, race, or whatever, everybody got that one person that'll do something. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Facts. Like, I had one of my homies named TK. He's an unforgiving. You know what I mean? And that was my dog. That was my right hand right there. We were cool. There's no gang segregation or none of that. You got every gang in one dorm. So everybody will have a mutual respect for one another, but he just didn't like basically the white oppression in prison. And that's what made him want to be a part of that. But he wasn't racist, even though the symbolism behind the things that he had tattooed on his body would be racist. His own views out of his own mouth. He wasn't racist, but he was proud to be white. And you're not going to, you're not going to mess with him. The kid's short. He's like five, four, but he's got machetes and swords. Like he doesn't play, you know what I mean? So, Mad respect on the compound, but a lot of the other people in his organization, I mean, they weren't nothing. Most, the majority of white boys, they're either boys, as in like booty bandits are on them already, or they're getting extorted. Yeah. Well, it sounds just like my stories, man. Yeah, right? I, I, you know, I hate to say that I enjoy hearing someone say this stuff, even though it's horrible things going on. Uh, but it's good to hear people back up certain things that I say, even though you are in Florida. But like I said, uh, it's nothing like the West Coast, man. Yeah, uh, from what 
But I heard it's a lot different out there. And and everyone that talks to me from the West, man, they're all like, man, that's a damn Twilight Zone. You know, that's yeah. I wouldn't know how to function, you know, being uh, together with everyone, doing everything together type stuff. So yeah, right. Uh, before I ask you a couple questions about prison, um, well, how much time did you do all together? I should have asked that in the beginning. Um, in prison, I did thirty six months. I did three years. Three years, okay. And uh, you're out now. How long you been out? Doing all right? I've been out since 2015. 2015. Okay, you've been out for a decent amount of time. That's good. Yeah. Um, so, when you get to... Well, first, let me ask you. What was the crazy thing you, craziest thing you've seen in county, man? If you can think in of... county? If you could think of one thing, what was one of the wildest or craziest things you either done or seen in county? Bro, the craziest thing in county for me was a fight that I got into that completely just like took me off guard. So I was in the dorm and this is one of my first dorms going in. Um, there's another blood in there. He looked white as hell, blue eyes and everything, but he claims he's like half Mexican, got Mexicano or Chicano or something tatted on his back. And um, I mean like in Tampa, in Florida period, when you're in the street, you see a lot of face tattoos. It's, it's a common thing. You're like, I got two on me. It's a common thing. But when I went in here, I mean, people were just... Literally. Like, yeah. So this kid had bull horns on his head, teardrops, M16s across his throat, gold teeth, everything, right? And he he was probably like my age now. So he was probably like 24 at the time. I'm 18. He's already done a, like a couple bids. Um, and he's in there facing charges that carry forever time. So we got cool, you know what I mean? We're cool. There was another blood though from the feds named Solo. He would he doesn't talk to anyone. Quietest dude I've ever seen. He wasn't that big. I mean, he was kind of cocky, he was short, um, but he never spoke. And that's what everybody, everyone just was like, had their guard up about him because anyone that doesn't speak, you're like, why? Why isn't he talking? Why is he so coy? What is he thinking about? And then the word was, he just beat a murder charge and now he's fighting his gun case. And I mean, like it was to the point, like he got caught with a body in the trunk, like all this extra. And you know, a lot of people just talk about it, but they never ask him directly. And I mean, you're not supposed to anyway, but I was cool with the other one. I didn't really speak to Solo. I wasn't introduced to him. So I wasn't just gonna walk up to him. I'm still learning jail politics. I was used to juvie, but you know, county's a little bit different. And all of a sudden, my boy from the street gets moved into the dorm. So he's in a different gang, but we're all under basically the same thing. You know what I mean? We're all rocking on the same side. He's just under a different name. Okay. Well, hold on. So the, comes, the Chicano guy, the guy who had Chicano on him, uh, he was a blood too? Yeah, he was a blood. And he just, he, he looked white, but he said he was, he was part Mexican or something? Yeah, like I said, a lot of people be trying to pull that race, like, oh, I'm this percent, that, this percent. I don't know if that was the case, if he actually was, like, his baby's mother was Mexican, his kids mixed or whatever. I don't know if he was himself, though. But okay, that's what he said, and he never – it's not like I had a reason to question him. Okay. He seemed authentic. Hold on, let me and, get my uh, dog out of here, man. Let me get my dog out of here. Gotcha. She would have been posted up by that damn door for an hour. <laughs> all right uh all right so where were we at uh uh okay your homeboy coming in your homeboy from the streets coming in yeah so he comes in so your homeboy first. from the streets comes into the uh block all right yeah you i'm knew excited him you, know you knew I mean? him really good yeah we were hanging out doing all type of dirt together like that was my dog okay, and uh okay. So I'm pumped up now. Like, I got my boy in here with me. Like, we're chilling, da-da-da. Run up to him, shake him up. And um, Solo comes out of nowhere. The quiet one from the feds. Comes out of nowhere. Gets up in my face in front of the whole dorm, in front of everybody. The CO didn't see it because he had already planned to have someone distract the CO. So he gets up in my face and he's pointing, like, pushing into my chest, like, hey, come see me on the rec yard. So I'm looking at him like, I'm just so blowed that he did this, that Wait, he had the audacity. Were, were you a little worried, man? 
bruh, I mean, I'm not going to say I wasn't, I didn't have a feeling in my stomach because I feel like everybody does and I'd be fake if I say I didn't. But I'm just like, this man just poked me in my chest in front of everyone. I'm thinking I'm cool in here. I'm playing chess and checkers and cards and everybody's straight. No one's tried me, nothing like that. My dog's in here with me. He comes up and just out of nowhere is like, come see me on the right yard. So I'm like, what the hell? I'm looking at my boy like, how you know how we want to do this you know what i mean and um we talking basically like trying to formulate a plan because we don't know when we walk out there if there's going to be a mob of people ready to flip us or whatever it is so another guy walks up someone who isn't affiliated and he's like hey solo wanna wanna view y'all outside you know what i mean y'all gotta go on the rec yard y'all gotta check pc i'm like pc what is that never heard of it so we slide out onto the rec yard and solo's in the corner he got his Velcro shoes. I got slippers, like slides. We don't get shoes. So this man got shoes and everything ready. Shirt off, everything. He's in the corner, ready to go. So he tells me to tighten up. So I catch the wall. And I mean, bro, you know when you fight and you like this here, you see the other guy and you're ready to, you know, first punch, first punch. Out of nowhere, I see this gray thing fly up it's the goddamn velcro shoe boom kicks me in my head i guess he knew some mma type <laughs> muay thai i don't know what it was but a foot came up bomb two hands bomb bomb i'm just like what the hell is this so i start throwing them you know what i mean we're fighting we're fighting i'm not winning by any means but i'm fighting and that's really all that mattered we're bumping we're bumping we're bumping he takes the wall I'm long, you know what I mean? I'm like six foot, six one, so I got a little bit of reach on me. So I start tagging them when we're going at it, and uh, he break it up, you know what I mean? They stop the fight or whatever, and then he called out my boy. He calls out uh, my boy. My boy gets in there. My boy is like six two, six three. So my boy is really like teeing off on him just because he got boy, that. Is your boy white dude, black dude? What, what is he? Nah, he's black. Okay, and he just came in the block, and they're already running up on him like that. Just, but it's only solo. No one else is doing nothing. I why no one it. else is saying nothing. It's just solo. Solo wanted to do this. We don't know why. So he fights my boy, and then right after he fights him, um, he looks at me, and more or less he asks me a blood question. You know, I'm not gonna put it all out on YouTube and everything, but. He asked me something and I answered it. He asked me again. I answered it louder. He asked me again. I answered it louder. He did the same thing with my boy and looked at everybody outside in the rec yard. He's like, these my brothers. Any of y'all got a problem? We all going in on you. So everybody out here understand that. And I mean, that was my first TOH. So in Florida, Florida State Prison specifically, if anybody Googles this, a TOH is a test of heart. Usually doesn't happen until you get to prison. It's mandatory that it happens in prison. It's going to happen, period. But my first one happened in the county. He just really wanted to find out if we had the heart to do what we were going to do. After that, he was talking to us. We were eating together. You know, everything was good. But it was just crazy after the fact because once I started speaking to him, I found out how, how high up in the ranks he really was. To the point that it became an honor to get my ass whooped by somebody like him. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. if you're going to get whooped, that's the type of guy you want to whoop you. You don't want anyone else to do it. But it was just crazy to me that someone like this on this status did that and it played out the way it played out. You know what I mean? Well, that's cra that is a crazy story, man. Uh, yeah. They ever hit you with any more of those when you got to the penitentiary, too? Oh, hell yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. The penitentiary don't play. It's different. Like... When I went, I was 18, you know what I mean? So when I went to prison, on the bus to prison, I'm sitting in the back of the bus, and I got, like, two white guys with me that I'm really not taking serious. You know, they got old, like, Nazi tattoos. I was never into none of that. My stepmother is black. You know, my girlfriend's black. My daughter's mixed. I was never for none of the race stuff, period. I didn't believe in it. I wasn't going to rock with it. Um... And that's not just that's not the people I was around on the street to begin with. So they're telling me about, you know, the youth offenders. So when you go to Florida State Prison, you can be sentenced as a youth offender, which means that your sentence can only carry up to six years or you can be sentenced as an adult. 
The reason you don't want to get sentenced as a youth offender is because you're going to go through hell, period. Um, so the youth offenders is basically 14 to 24 years old, state prison. It's not a juvenile program. It's not a boot camp. You're in state prison. You're going to the same reception center as all the adults. You're just going to get put into a youth dorm. Okay. okay. So the, yeah, I think I've seen that before on uh, Lock Up Raw or something. I watched that, how they yeah. did that. Yeah. This is gladiator school. You know what I mean? So when you get to, you know, we're on the bus and they're telling me about all this. You're going to get TOH. You're going to da 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 da. I'm just telling myself in my head, you know, I feel like I'm going to throw up the whole damn bus ride hearing all this. I feel sick in my stomach, but I'm just telling myself I'm not going to let no one, you know, abuse me. I'm not going to let nobody rob me. I'm not going to let, I'm just not going for it. I got to do my time. I got to do my time. But from before I even got to prison, I understood that I need to move as if I have a life sentence because there's people around me that do. And I need to have the same mentality as them if I'm going to be amongst them, even though I got three years. So when I get to the reception center, everybody gets off the bus. You know, you got 20 people on the wall in front of you, 20 people on the wall you're on. You know, the guides, they're already yelling at you. There was a guide at uh, – I was in Central Florida, so you get sent to CFRC, which is in Orlando, the Central Florida Reception Center. I think we have four reception centers in the state of Florida. So we had a guard named 6-6. He was a big black dude. He was – I mean, everybody knew him as a crip. A lot of these officers were game banging. So that was a whole other element because once they see your tattoos, they're going to treat you a certain way. So we all get off the bus, and he more or less told us, you got five seconds to take all your clothes off. Starts yelling, five, four, three, two. I'm flying out of everything, you know what I mean? Got all your clothes in front of you, got to pick some up. And then you just got to do the whole everything, the search. We had to grab onto a fence, squat. He's making us bounce. Like, they're really trying to make you feel not in control and let you know they're in control. They're getting up in your face. They're screaming at you. There was a dude in a wheelchair with no legs. They had him butt naked in the wheelchair screaming at him. You know what I mean? Like, they didn't spare anybody. And uh, when you're – I wasn't sentenced as a youth offender, but they reclassify you when you get to your reception center because of your age or priors or whatever. Yeah. So if you're 18, you do a bid, you get out at 20, you go back at 21, you might not be a youth offender because you already did it. You yeah. know what I mean? They got a point system kind of like that over here too. Yeah, so we get red hats when you're a youth defender. So I'm in my boxes. I walk up. They do my weight. He gives me the red hat. I'm like, damn, bro. Everyone that I was with was an adult. And they were all like, hey, I hope you don't have to go to the youth. I hope you don't have to. They call it JIT camp. JIT in the state of Florida is a nickname for a kid. So JIT camp, that's what they call it. And everyone's like, I hope you don't have to go to JIT camp. I hope you don't have to. They gave me the red hat, bro, and everybody I was with was like, damn, bro. So seeing that reaction off of all these dudes, I was like, what am I about to step into? You know what I mean? Put on my hat. They give you a paper. It says, if you want to eat, you got to memorize this now. So I memorized it. I was good with, you know, memorizing things like that. I memorized it. You had one chance to say it right. I went first. So I stood up. I said it, I got it right, he let me eat. The kid next to me, he stood up, he said it, he got it wrong. The officer slapped the tray into his face, told him to pick up all the food off of the floor, throw it out, you're not eating until tomorrow. So, you know what I mean? I'm smashing my food, this kid's next to me starving, you can't hand nobody. How the hell, see, that's not even right, man. Bro, the COs in Florida beating you. Like, the second you get there, beat it. I'll, I'll get into it, especially at the youth defenders. So. When I go over to the youth dorm in Orlando at CFRC, it's hotel dorm, uh, age dorm. So all the guys got a joke, like what happens in age dorm stays in age dorm. So I'm like, damn. So when I go, I'm by myself. I got like my whole little, you know, like blanket and all that, sheets, whatever. I walk into the dorm and the office is right there. It's like some old redneck. He was cool. He he wasn't like crazy, he wasn't getting in my face or nothing, but he told me to look to my left. I looked to my left. So how they have it is they divide it into three different dorms or three different like cell blocks within the dorm. So the first one, H1, 
I forget if it was H1 or what it was actually called. I think it was Quad 1, Quad 1, 2, and 3. So Quad 1 is 18 and under. Quad 2 is 19 to 20, and Quad 3 is 21 to 24. If you look at Quad 3, 21 and 24, they all look like old men. They're all sitting there drinking coffee. No one's bothering nobody. They're eating their food. 19 to 20, it was like a mix. But when you look at 18, this is the most wildest one. These are where all the craziest kids are at. You know what I mean? So he told me to look to my left. I look, and I don't think there was one Spanish or white person in there. Everybody was black. Everybody. And they're all staring at me through the glass wall. So I look over. I got all these eyes on me. I'm like, oh, this is about to be fun. So he tells me, he's like, I'm not telling you what to do, but don't let nobody take your stuff. Don't let nobody, you know, he basically just handle your business when you get in there. So I got in there. Um, he had my roommate help me put my stuff up. So he's like, who is in this cell? Da, da, da. Cause there's a downstairs and the upstairs. And I see this white kid get off the floor. Like you're not even on the bench. You know what I mean? Like you're not even sitting at the table. So I already think this white kid's soft. He helps me put up all my stuff and set up my bed. Then we go downstairs. So what is he sitting like Indian style on the floor and shit? Yeah, you know what I mean? Just real timid looking. Like, I'm just like, man, this is my celly. Like, I know you don't got my back. <laughs> so when I'm in there, um, the second the officer leaves, the door shuts, I get called to a table. So first quarter, I sit down. There's only four seats at a table, but there was probably like 14 people at this table when I sat down. You know what I mean? Everybody's trying to look big, and everybody's trying to sit there, look tough, staring at you. And... um. I'm sitting there, bro. My hands are like this. I'm just like, I'm ready. You know what I mean? Like, they started talking, asking me questions. I just told them straight up, like, look, I'm blood. I don't care what none of y'all talking about. I'm not answering all this. You're not going to sit here and keep asking me stuff. I want my TOA. That's it. I just want to fight. I know y'all going to do it. I'm not going to sit here pretending you ain't going to do it. I want my TOA. That's it. So they're like, just, you know, chill. We're trying to talk. I don't want to talk. I want my t- my adrenaline already pumping. You know what I mean? I don't want to. I'm the type like I don't like fighting. But if we're going to fight, I'd rather you just hit me and we start fighting. I'm, I I don't like the whole, you know, we're in middle school. You tell me at 10 o'clock in the morning we're going to fight after school at three down the street. And I got to sit the whole day thinking about it. You know, I don't like all that. I'd rather just get right to it. And um. You know, so supposedly I'm at a table full of bloods or whatever. And then they start asking me, like, where you from? I was like, I'm from Tampa. What's up? Oh, you know, da, da, da. And they named the name. I'm like, yeah, we from the same hood. So they call them over. And come to find out somebody that I know very, very well is right here with me. So, yeah, he verifies everything, da, da, da. And everybody just, they, they demeanor calm down just off of that verification from someone that I know from the street that knew me. We were just in juvie together and everything. So um, they basically, I, I fought my cellmate, the little scary looking white kid. I found out he had 15 years mandatory. So, you know, I only got three. I'm thinking this kid got life. Like, I'm like, I don't know what's on this kid's mind. He got 15, he ain't number 18 years old. I don't even want to sleep. You know what I mean? But they're like, hey, you got you to gotta tighten your roommate up. So we fight. That was over real quick. I never even got hit. Not to like try to show off or nothing, but like I said, he wasn't somebody that it wasn't a fair fight anyway. You know what I mean? And you had to do it. Yeah, they just they wanted to see me fight. Tell people because I told a story about this man, someone that came in the block. Some you know, I guess you want to say OG or whatever. Told someone that to go beat someone up, and they were actually really good friends the whole time until the dude came in. And started, you know, regulating stuff and sending out orders and whatever. Uh, what would have happened if you didn't go in there and, and piece them up a little bit? I probably would have got buck fifty that same day. Yeah, they would have got me up out of there. It would have been a quick cut, and that would have been it. You know what I mean? They would have acted like they were cool with you. You would have got out in the back of the line with them because we got to march. When you're in the youth defenders, we're marching. Half step. We gotta do cadence at that right, left, right, left, right. It's like the military. They make us PT and everything. You know what I mean? So like, when we're marching, it's rows of three. You're marching together, so we'll get in the back of the line, and they'll just come up and rip you real quick. 
Now you holding your face together. The CEO going to see you. and You're going to get put in PC. Well, not, you're not going to get put in PC unless you ask for PC. You're going to get put in AC confinement under investigation, and then you'll most likely get let out or sent to another camp. You have you got to sign PC, though. You're not just going PC off rip. So anybody from Florida that said they got put in PC, you didn't get put in PC. Because when I got cut, I didn't get put in PC. You know what I mean? When I got fired up, I didn't get put in PC. But if you got to fight and you rocking with a gang, you, you got to fight. That's what it is. Otherwise, you're just going to get X'd out real quick. You have to build that reputation and when you're in the youth defenders violence is everything that is your reputation you know what i mean mm-hmm. and um so yeah push come to shove everybody got cool real quick because uh how it works is you're only in the reception center for like a month and like a week before you get transferred to your first prison so we were there for about three weeks and then all the kids that were there when we first got there they all got shipped off so now in another week week all the new kids are going to come and we're going to seem like the old timers and we're going to be excuse me we're going to be running down on them um the extortion game is huge in florida that's that's the main thing and being that all of my family's from massachusetts i didn't really have anyone sending me any money and i more or less had a feeling like and i mean a lot of people share this feeling that if you were eating but you couldn't physically, you know, basically if you were soft, you weren't going to eat. And that's just how it was. And I mean, it was bad. It was to a point that we don't even care about canteen. We're going to take state trays from you. We're going to take biscuits in the morning, coffee cakes. We're taking the juice, the cookie, the brownie, and you're going to starve. So you got to fight for your food. And if you want to eat, you got to fight to get food. So someone hits canteen and you know that they're not or whatever, or you want to test them and see what, about you're gonna test them and that's again like a toh but tohs are rarely ever just hands you know what i mean so after cfrc that's where i did the most of my fighting was in the reception center that's where almost all of my fights happened at um i get sent to my first prison and this is sumter ci so this is in the country whitey bulger uh the federal prison he was at was only like a 15, 20 minute drive from the state prison that I was at. So we get to Sumter CI, the guards from Orlando that drove us there, you know, we're in like a van. There's not many of us. There's probably only 12 of us that got shipped. And the guy in the van, he looks back, he's like, listen, you know, we come off hard because it's our job. We want y'all to respect us. We want y'all to respect each other. These guys don't play by the rules we play by. They play very differently. So just be on point and listen to everything they say. He gave us a warning, bro. So we're like, oh, damn, this is about to be serious. You know what I mean? We pull up. All the COs are outside already. I forget his name, but he was the sergeant. I mean, Clark Diesel. His shirt was so goddamn tight. It must have been like a medium. Chest muscles popping out. You can see his abs through the shirt. Come to find out, he was ex-Army Special Forces. He's been in the um, in DOC for like 20 years now. He had the little brim sergeant hat and everything. He rips open the van door real quick, and he whispers to us. He's like, can all y'all hear me? We're like, yes, sir. You got five seconds to get off this bus. Yes, sir. He gets quiet. All of a sudden, five, four, three. To, like the army boot camp voice we're flying out of the thing we're all falling on top of each other they're grabbing us by the shirt throwing us up against the fence pushing us under you know what i mean they're looking at our tattoos i had three officers run up in my face they're like oh you a blood they saw the tattoos at the time we were at war with the zoes which is a haitian gang you know what i mean that was the current war at something ci so they're like oh there ain't no bloods here them zoes gonna get you quick da 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 like they're really just talking that tough talk. So they're in your face spitting when they talk, whatever, whatever. We got to run everywhere we go. We got to run up to the lady, the classification lady, tell her our, our info, run back. So I'm the last one to the right in the line. And they tell me when I say go, you're going to run through that door. And all I see is a staircase with a door under it and the lights off in the room. Thinking to myself, I'm not running in there. I don't know what the hell's in there but I'm not running in there. 
So he says, go. I tell the kid next to me, hey, bro, run in there. He did it. I didn't think he was going to listen to me, but he did it. He runs in there, and I see him go into the dock and fly right back out. <laughs> Flies back out, lands on his back. I'm like, that's why I didn't go in there. I told you I'm not going in there. CEO grabs me, boy, you got a listening problem, da, da, da. I said, nah. He said, nah, only thing you gnaw on is carrots and, you know, I don't want to yeah. say it just out of respect, but you know what I'm getting at. I'm like, what? What did he just say? So he makes me run in there. I run in there. It was so, like, bright outside. There was a light in the room. It just looked dark as hell from outside. I get into the room, and there's, like, four or five officers dressed in all black. And this is like the squad, like, you know, the Ninja Turtle squad when they come in the suits and they extract you out of the cells and stuff. This is that squad. You know what I mean? This is like the emergency squad. So everybody in here is like 6'2 and above. Everybody weighs like 250. The second I go in, I see the guy in front of me. I get grabbed like this from somebody right here that was waiting. I'm lifted up in the air and slammed down on my back. And from that, it was just boots and fish. And they did that one after the other, you know what I mean? Everybody got beat. The second we got there, everybody got beat. We had boot marks on our face, everything. That's crazy, uh, man. And this yeah, is they, supposed to be the youth offender, even yeah, though y'all, well, the, the, even though y'all are adults. Yeah, the reason they do this is um because they know that they can get away with it. We're green compared to other convicts. You know what I mean? You do that at a not to say that they don't get beat at the adult prisons because they definitely do. There's just a higher chance of a CO getting air flighted up out of there versus in the youth offender it's rare that a co gets touched because they for one almost everybody at the prison is related so the captain's wife is the head nurse her daughter is married to the sergeant so you can't get into it with any of them or otherwise everyone comes down on you so come to find out the head of the zoos is in this dorm with me the main head of who we're at war with and all my boys that were in the reception center before me when they came to Sumter, they all got flipped in the barber shop. One of them got cut. Another one got fired up with a pair of barber clippers. Another one got fired up with a brick. Fired up is like you put a rock in a sock or a lock in a sock or a brick in a canteen bag and smack it off someone's head. Um, and you just basically, you get a patch in your head. And that so all the bloods that came before me got took off the compound the second they got there. So... That's basically what the word was when I got there. Now, when I got there, being that I'm from Tampa, Tampa got its own prison gang called NPR. And the head of NPR, shout out to Quay, the head of NPR was in C-Dorm where I was at. And this is, he was like the hardest bumping kid at something. You know what I mean? Like he's just knocking everything out. Nobody wanted to fight Quay. They had rumors that he had metal plates in his hands because everybody he fights, their jaw is just hanging off. You know what I mean? But we get the Sumter, and um, things started popping off real quick. You know what I mean? We started extorting people that were in there because we weren't just going to sit there and act like we were new to this. You know what I mean? What but you mean we? Second, uh, bloods or the NPR? NPR. I was the only blood in there. So, all right, there was another blood in me in there with me from uh, at CFRC. And he came in. He said he was blood. Da, da, da. Then there was a Mexican kid that was supposedly sir 13 but he folded his flag he said he wasn't banging that no more the night we got shipped to something supposedly the blood brought the ex sir 13 home i found out about this in the van on the ride over i'm thinking to myself there's no way for one who are you to bring him home you know what i mean because everybody can't do that you got to be somebody to do that for two why would you bring somebody home that already folded their flag to another organization. They have no loyalty. You know what I mean? Once you join, you join. That's it. You're not pancaking to every other gang depending on what suits you or what's convenient. So when we hit Sumter, the word was three bloods just hit C-Dorm. I ran down on both of them. I sat them both down and I told them, neither one of you were blood, neither one of you were banging. How y'all want to rock about it? You know what I mean? Y'all want to fight about it? Y'all want to slang iron about it? We can do it. Because I got, I had something to set. The first day I got there, I got a poker. It was like a long nail. I took a big pen. I emptied it out. I put the nail through the pen. And I tried to burn it and keep it in there. And then I just put a handle on it. You know what I mean? So I had something immediately because I heard they were going to try to do something. And um, 
So I ran down on them and both of them folded. Both of them were like, all right, we're not, we're not going to bang. We're not. So I was like, yeah, I know. You know what I mean? So I'm, uh, I'm in the shower and I got my stuff on the little concrete wall that comes up. I'm under the water. I turn back. All my stuff's gone. I'm like, damn, somebody took my, you know what I mean? Took my stuff. I go out into the dorm and I bay check. You know, bay check, bay check. They used to do things like this to test you. You'll come in, your own people will take your things and act like they're in another gang. So if you're a blood and you come in, when you come in, everybody's going to run up and say they're crit just to see how you react. If you're going to hold your own down, you know what I mean? So someone took my stuff. I went out there. I started bay checking. Within, you know, probably like less than 30 seconds, someone runs up and gives me all my stuff. Oh, I didn't know you. You were blood. I'm from Jacksonville. We're tied. So Jacksonville got a gang called Cutthroats. And at the time, Bloods, NPR, and Cutthroats, we were all tied together. We were all rocking together. So my stuff gets returned to me. But then on top of that, he goes and takes the fake blood that I just folded. He takes all of his stuff, gives it to me. So I got double the stuff that I had. And then he threw me like Cause when you first get there in the reception, I mean, uh, in the orientation dorm, they don't let you hit canteen. So we can't eat any good food. So he threw me like two peanut butter squeezes and a soup just off GP. Like, yo, my bad, bro. Here, I ain't know. You know what I mean? Like no hard feelings type, whatever. But I'm still like booting up cause it's the first time something like this happened to me. So I'm mad and you obviously don't want to show weakness, but the situation de-escalated with all that. And um, I had the Zoes come up to me. So the Zoes call me in the corner and I'm talking to them and they said, you know, why would you fold the only two people you have with you? Like your only brothers. Cause MPI was only rocking with me because I was from Tampa. You know what I mean? I don't think all the bloods and all the NPR got along, but they rocked with me because I was from there. So they asked me, they, they were like, why would you fold the only two brothers? And I told them I'd rather be one strong than 500 weak. I'm not going to have people like that around me, rocking with me, pretending to be what I am. Because the second I'm gone, one of y'all going to do the same thing I did to them. And more or less, they respected it. But we wasn't cool or nothing like that. I still had to watch everything. They um they flipped the dorm. They ended up finding my poker. It was in my bunk. I had a poker and I had a razor in my mouth. We all had to line up for searches. I spit the razor out. I didn't get caught with the razor. But they found the poker in the bunk when they uh, put it through the uh, metal detector. So now I got to do 60 days in confinement. This is what's crazy, too, is in Florida, I heard a lot of other places you get outside charges for what you do in prison. And in Florida, if I cut you, it's 60 days for assault on an inmate. And then if they find the razor, it's another 60 days for the razor. So you do 120 days in confinement. And you come right back out on the same compound with the same person you cut. Y'all might be in the same dorm. Damn. There's no, that's there's no separation. Yeah, like that's it, it's it's crazy. So when I went to confinement, um, they put me in the room with a crib uh, from Daytona Beach. And we didn't really have any problems or nothing like that. You know what I mean? It wasn't like it was going to be on site. And especially when you're in confinement, you want to do your best to try to get along with whoever you're in there with. Cause you're stuck in there. Um, another crip got moved in and he's like inside of the confinement dorm. He's a couple doors down or whatever. We can't see him from the door though. So we can't like sign him or nothing like that. He couldn't sign him, but he basically told him to fight me and the, he didn't want to fight. The crip didn't want to fight the one in the room with me. He didn't want to. So what he did is he waited until nighttime after showers when the lights went out and he told me straight up, he was like, yo, bro, I don't want to get into it while we're in the room together. Da, da, da. So he pulled a stunt. I didn't participate in this. I sat on my bunk and let him do what he did because that's between him and his brothers. This man threw his body up against the cell door. So it goes, Brr. he's hitting the walls, hitting the foot lockers. He's trying to make it sound like we tearing it down. But I told him before he did it, if you're going to do that. You're not going to tell them you beat me. You know what, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. You're not going to tell them nothing like that. So he got on the door and told his brother, like, oh, yeah, we fought. He bumping, though, da, 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 like, whatever, whatever. So 
two of my brothers get moved into the cell across from ours so they can see in our cell now. You know what I mean? And I guess our people, they put a lot of opposite gang members in the cells together. It's crazy, but that's what they do in Florida. So we got word from the orderlies that serve out the food that um, our people got into it on the compound. And anytime something happens on the compound, if you hear that your brother got into it with this gang and you're in the room with that gang, y'all going to tear it down in the cell every single time. You know what I mean? Because you, your, your people just hit my boy up. I'm going to sit here and you like with you and be cool. So they get moved in from across from me and they tell me to fight them. So I tell them, yo, bro, we got to fight. We're not doing that little fake stunt you did. Like, we're going to fight. And we fought. And I mean, he wasn't like he wasn't really a fighter like that. He wasn't really good with his hands like that. But he fought, but he didn't win. He damn sure didn't win. And my people saw it. So this was my first fight at this prison. Two of my brothers saw it. So, you know, my name goes up a little bit. Like, okay, yeah, he did that. He beat blah, 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 blah. Our cell floods out, and we get moved upstairs into another cell, and another one of my brothers come in. So I start talking to him with sign language and on the door. He tells me that he's going to cut my bunkie when he gets out. So I'm like, wow, what happened? And um, I guess my roommate, the same one I have fought, was saying super, super disrespectful things on the compound when he was in a different dorm. So like no one was able to really get to him. I didn't know none of that. So you want, like I said, your reputation is everything. You want to build a name, especially inside of the youth defenders. So I signed up for it. I wrote him, I was like, bro, I'll do it. What's up? He's like, oh, I got a razor in the room right now. Mind you, when I said I'll do it, like, oh, I'll get out of confinement and do it when we get out of confinement in 60 days. You know what I mean? Like, we'll talk about it. Tells me he got a razor in the room with him right now. So, I mean, I already signed up for it. I can't back out now. So I'm like, all right, shoot the razor. So what he did is he he broke. Because when you get to Florida State Prisons, if it isn't a sight camp, you get a, a shaving razor the second you get there. So you get the little single razor. You pop it out, tie it on a pencil, whatever. What he did is he broke half of it. He put it behind a stamp on an envelope, put all of his pictures in the envelope, and he asked the CO when he came to do his rounds, can you pass my picture to da da da? I want to show him my family pictures. So he did it. So I got the pictures in the room with me and I got the razor under the stamp. So I have one of those little flexible pens that you get uh, on canteen when you're in confinement because you can only get like the flex pens and paper envelopes and stamps when you're in confinement. And I take the string from my, my mat and I tie the razor on. Like I put the stamp over the sharp side and it didn't really like cut through. I tied it on. And um, what he did is he called my roommate to the door. So the windows are only like this big. I'm sitting on the toilet, bro. I feel like I'm going to throw up. I feel like I'm going to, because I've never done nothing like this. You know what I mean? And I've told people, that's another reason I wanted to come on this show. Because like, when you can speak to someone that can relate, it's a whole nother conversation versus when you speak to people, I feel like in society, a lot of people will view it like you're trying to sound hard or you're trying to, sound like this type of way when that really isn't the case you're just speaking on your experience and um to me you know growing up playing video games watching movies bb guns paintball guns if you said we're gonna go and shoot something it's like okay you know that's the it makes a little bit more sense because we're already you've already witnessed violence in one sense or another whether it's video games or tv like shooting doesn't sound too crazy but when you say you're gonna take a razor and cut someone's face it's like, what? You're crazy. You know what I mean? But that's the prison. That's what you have to adapt to. So more or less, he called dude to the door. When he went to the door, I was sitting on the toilet. I ran up. I pushed his face into the, into the wall and I hit him up. You know what I mean? I hit him on his neck or whatever. And I'm, I didn't know what was going to happen, if it was going to shoot out. None of that happened. It was nothing crazy. The razor wasn't even brand new. But um, I hit him. He started bleeding. So he turned around and I'm thinking now he's going to crash me or whatever. And he starts kicking the cell door. Bam, 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 bam. COs come in. I still got the razor because I don't know if he's going to run at me. So I'm going to keep hitting him with it. And right before the COs, you can hear them coming up the stairs. I flushed the razor. When the COs came to the door, the second they came to the door, he turned his neck. He showed where he got cut. And he said, I, I want to kill myself. 
So I'm like, what? What'd he say? So he tells him, I want to kill myself. I, I know dude's full name and everything like that. I ain't going to put him out there, but I respected the hell out of him for that. He didn't have anything to come back at me. He didn't want to snitch either. He didn't want to say the obvious that I did that. He told them that he did it to himself. They took him out. They ended up shipping him down to uh, Miami where they have like the mental health facility. He came back like the next day or the day after that. They put him in the cell next to me, right next door to me. And he told me, he's like, yeah, you got me, bro. But when we get out, I got you. You know what I mean? Like, that's how it's going to be. I'm not going to get on the door and talk crazy and all this and that. But I told him, I was like, I respect you for not saying nothing. But still, I don't like you. You know what I mean? And that was my first time, you know, you got lucky doing something. Hell. Yeah, bro. I got mad lucky. But then again, you only get another 60 days, bro. So it really ain't nothing. Like, you do a little well, bit I mean, more. Well, you could have killed him. Oh, yeah, that too. <laughs> Yeah, you know what I mean? And not only that, uh, well, I guess, yeah, you're right in that aspect because over here, you know, the first thing that happens, man, they're like, uh, you want to press charges? They'll ask you that as soon as you get, either if someone gets stabbed, uh, even you get, shoot, I know someone that got was about to go home and got years more just for strong arm robbery for stealing someone's cookies, man. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I heard they do that in New York too, but like in Florida, bro, the only time I heard about outside charges is if you air flight someone off the compound because of the bills of a hospital coming or if you kill them, yeah. if they die, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. because when we first got into um, the orientation dorm, me and two other NPRs, we ran down on somebody and, you know, what was supposed to happen was we both had like little pokers made out of fence, like fence wire. You know what I mean? We straighten them out, you shopping them up. And we were just like, you know, like poking at him. We weren't stabbing him. We were just trying to make him like break it off. We're going to extort you. You know what I mean? So one kid yoked him up. <laughs> but while he yoked him up and we're poking him, the kid was choking him the whole time. But we thought he was just holding him in place. So we're telling him like, break it off, break it off. And we look up and the kid turns blue. And we're like, bro, let go of him. What are you doing? He lets go. The kid hits the floor. We think he's out of there. You know what I mean? Now, they got cameras in the dorm um, so it can see who goes into the bathroom. So we didn't know what to do with him. You know what I'm saying? So more or less, like, he got put, like, kind of, like, under a toilet. And we got the hell out of the bathroom. You know what I mean? We called a couple people in the bathroom, and then we all left at the same time. So that if something happens, mad people are going under investigation. It's going to be even harder to figure out what's what. The kid woke up. We were all like, we're not doing this no more. Somebody needs to send us some money. We don't want to do this. That's too close. Like, it was just too much. But yeah. something, see, I, it was just mostly fighting. There's a lot of fighting. And it would be a lot of, like, if you got 10 people with you and I got five with me, well, we're all going to fight one-on-ones. You know what I'm saying? Me and you were going to get in there first. My people and then your people are going to get in there. It was a lot of that. Sometimes people would get cut. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't that often. Um, but I turned 19 and I was too old to be at Sumter. I got transferred to Lancaster CI. And if anybody wants to take the time to Google Lancaster CI and the type of things that go on at Lancaster, this is the worst youth offender that you can get sent to. So this one's 14 to 24. It's a psych camp. So they have psych medication here. And... It was just on steroids, the amount of violence. You know what I mean? If less than, like, five people got cut or flipped in one day, we could still go to wreck. But if more than five people got hit up in one day, we couldn't go to wreck. Like, it was known people were getting hit up. All right, let me so, ask you this. Well, first off, was these youth, youth offender camps worse? Uh, see, I, I don't like calling it youth offender because everyone in there is a damn adult. You know what I mean? And, yeah. And well, I, not not everybody. Not, I mean, not everyone, but you can go in there as an adult. Yeah. And that's kind of crazy. Uh, but at the same time, I, it makes sense. Uh, so when you went to these little camps, youth, youth offender camps, did that go hard? Uh, go more hard than the county or jail? Oh, county, hell yeah. Okay. County was a cakewalk. Okay. Now. Uh, 
when you got moved to this new facility, what do you think was the most lethal or craziest thing that you've seen in that in that facility? I seen a kid get hit up with a box cutter, and you know, he got hit. They ran up on him. My kid jumped on his back. He ripped them from here all the way to around the back of his head. They picked them up, slammed them on the floor. They jumped on them with a real box cutter from the street. And uh, his pinky was split in half and was hanging on by just a couple veins or whatever. They cut the tendons out of his hands. He can't close his hands anymore. They got on this kid and just mutilated him with a box cutter. That's that was funny. between that and then when I got fired up, I got a patch missing in the back of my head. I don't know if you can see it, but when I got hit, um, one of my people popped off on someone and hit him with a brick. I got crashed. So a kid ran up on me in front of the bubble and hit me with a brick so the COs could see it because he wanted to go to confinement. It's like a gangster check-in. You know what I mean? Like you're going PC, but you did something gangster to do it. And um, when that happened, they took two random people that had nothing to do with it. They took us all into a back room. I'm bleeding. The other Zoe's bleeding. We're all handcuffed. Four officers came in. They put their gloves on. They grabbed those two inmates, and they beat them into the ground. And, I mean, one of the kids that had nothing to do with it was my brother, and he was screaming and crying and screaming for his mother, just screaming, screaming, while they're just pounding his face in. They broke his jaw. They broke his cheek. Like, everything was just swollen. Like, he got hit with a bat. That was one of the hardest things I had to see. But more or less, it was one of the hardest things I had to actually hear because yeah. I couldn't. You know what I mean? That yeah. was that was something that still bothers me to this day with seeing that. All right, let me ask you this, man. We're going to end it here. Uh, if you were to give anybody a piece of advice, one of the best pieces of advice that you could give someone about Florida lockup from what you've seen, what would it be? Just stand on your own, just like any other prison. You just got to... When you're in there, you have to do what you have to do. Just when you do it, don't let it consume you because the traits and characteristics that you add on to yourself while you're in there, the things you start doing to people and the things you start getting comfortable with that aren't considered normal into society, you're going to bring that mentality with you into society. And that's one of the hardest things to deal with. you got to break out of that. So when you go in there, if you have to go in there, do what you have to do, demand respect, Understand that if you're white, you're most likely going to have to hurt somebody to show people. Um, but don't be a victim, bro. That's that's the best advice I can give you. Don't be a victim. Be a man. Do what you got to do. Just do your time as peacefully as you can. Well, that's a good piece of advice, man. And uh, hopefully the, your stories deter some people from going to uh, or from doing crime and going to uh, Florida. Yeah, I don't want to by any means sound like it's it's fun or something like that. It's, it's disgusting, bro. When you see people hurt like that, when you have to do things or when things get done to you, like I cut somebody, I cut a few people, I got cut too. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everybody got hit up. But you just can't, you can't let it consume you. You can't fall victim at the same time, though, because there are kids, and we can get into that more on a part two, but we'll, we'll get into the broomsticks yeah. and all that part of the TOH and the other things that go on that is just it's some horror stories that'll really deter you away from wanting to commit a crime you know what I mean and now that I've been out I pride myself on the fact that I've made more money legally now than I ever did illegally so there's really no reason for me to go back and resort to the same things that I was doing you know what I mean okay yeah I do understand and that's good man congratulations to you for that actually let, sure. let me ask you one more thing man gotcha do you think gangbanging is more beneficial or not? In the youth offender, it isn't an option. I'm talking about in whole. In like life. Like in society and I'm everything? I'm talking about in life, family, friends, relationship. Do you think that gangbanging is more beneficial to you than not? To me personally, yes, because I wasn't raised with a functional family, so I found one. Okay. You know what I mean? That's a good no. enough answer, man, and I'm sure a yeah, lot of like people relate <laughs> to you. Uh, and, you know, believe it or not, a lot of people, they, they, the reason why they join gangs is for that simple fact, you know, that unity, the brotherhood. And that's one thing, you know, I speak about against gangs a lot. And that's simply because I don't want to see people die. I don't want to. I've yeah. seen, you know, I've got friends that died. I got friends that are locked up for life for doing stuff they didn't want to do. But at the same time, 
if I were to say one thing that I truly understand on why they would change, choose that path is because the unity, uh, yeah. the, the, the fellowship, the brotherhood, everyone's looking for something along those lines in life. No one wants to be alone. You know what yeah. I mean? They're always searching for some kind of uh, sense of belonging, you know, uh, whether it's religion, gangs, uh, gaming tags on the PS4, whatever the case is, man. You know, someone's yeah. always clicking up. Military, police, uh, there's groups everywhere, man, and they're all, you know, some some way, shape, or form a gang. You know what I mean? Definitely. But anyways, man, yeah, this, you had some very interesting stories, and we'll see how the comments fly on this one, man. I salute to you for coming on to the show, and if you got any kind of social media or anything, man, uh, go ahead and shout it out. Yeah, man, I appreciate you having me on here. My Instagram is 1090 underscore Jake. Um, that's about it, though, bro. I look forward to, you know, doing a part two, and I, I look forward to seeing the comments, too. Hey, me too, man. And uh, look, you've been out for how long? You said three years, four years? Yeah. That's good, man. You know, most people, they go back within two. So That's one of the reasons. And for anybody that doesn't know this because they don't really tell you this, if you're in Florida and you get out of prison, or if you're thinking about moving to Florida, Florida has a PRR law. If you get out of any state prison within three years and you move to Florida or you're released in Florida and you still live there, if you catch any violent offense, they double the amount of time that you get and they make it mandatory. So if you want to go to the club in Florida, you just got out of prison in Arkansas, you hit someone in the club, that's a felony battery punishable by up to five years, doing 10 years mandatory well damn i thought i wanted to move to florida you go to disney that's it when you're done with disney <laughs> you get up out of there that's it hey hey that sounds like damn true that's a crazy ass law yep but that's then why again, i got the hell up out of there then again if i was in florida i probably never would have went to prison for the stand your ground law you know that's another that's another thing. It's a very controversial law though, and it only works when you really got a lawyer that can make it work. Cause yeah. I've seen a lot of people fall victim to that. Yeah, I believe it. I believe it, man. Well, like I said, man, I appreciate you coming on and uh can't wait to do the part two, man. I'm sure the stories you're about to tell me with the broomsticks, that sounds very interesting. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> you be easy, be safe out there, all right, man? All right, bro, you too. All right, dog.